May 16, 2020. Um, we're just starting the audios on the third PowerPoint, the final exam, a few topics. And this PowerPoint, you guys, it's Unit 6, Microbial Genetics Part 2, and then Viruses, Prions, and Medical Microbiology. So um, we'll just see how it goes. Maybe I'll break this into smaller audios, or maybe we'll just go for it. Okay, so let's see. <clears throat> so in the previous PowerPoint, the final exam items, PowerPoint 2, we had finished with Microbial Genetics Part 1, where we went over um, DNA replication, transcription, and translation. And I forgot, folks, I didn't include a slide in there on inducible operons, so just the, the principles of inducible operons in bacteria. Um, so you recall, folks, that an an operon is a DNA sequence that encodes information for one or more structural proteins and it contains a promoter and also an operator. And you'll recall that, um, for example, in the LAC operon, if lactose isn't in the environment, the LAC I, the LAC repressor protein, binds to the operator and prevents RNA polymerase from transcribing the LAC Z, Y, and A genes. But if lactose is present in the environment, so lactose would be the inducer, the lactose, allolactose, binds to the repressor protein, causes it to change shape, so it can't bind to the operator anymore, and thus that gets rid of kind of like the roadblock, so now the bacterial RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter and can um, transcribe the lac operon gene. So as a result, you end up with beta-galactosidase and the lactose transport protein or permease protein and the transacetylase. Um, and we had also mentioned that they've discovered um, inducible antibiotic resistance operons in which an antibiotic acts as the inducer. Okay. And now, folks, let's see what we got here. Oh, well, there we go. Just like when face to face, you guys, like I tell you something and then I show you the slides. Okay, so cons constitutive genes, you guys, are expressed all the time. So like the genes um, for the glycolytic enzymes. And then we talk about inducible um, operons in which the um, the genes will only be expressed if a signal molecule is present. So for the lac operon, the signal molecule was lactose. And then we didn't we didn't go over repressible genes, folks. So we're not even going to mention that. And again, here's the here's the <clears throat> E. coli lac operon um, when lactose is not present. So the the lac I repressor protein, which is constitutively made, means it's always being transcribed and translated. If there's no lactose in the environment, it's going to bind to the um, the operator of the lac operon, so it sets up a roadblock. So when RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, it can't get past, it can't transcribe the genes. <clears throat> and then if we add, if we were to add um, lactose to the environment of the E. coli, the lactose allolactose would bind to the repressor protein, cause it to change shape, so it can no longer bind to the operator, and that's how we turn on, that's how we induce a transcription of the lac operon genes. And then folks, just really, really quickly on mutations. So mutations are a change in the genetic information of a cell or the genetic information of a virus. So in cellular organisms, you guys remember, there's a spontaneous mutation rate, and that's based on, even though DNA polymerases in cells do proofread, they still have a mistake rate even after they proofread. And so um, after proofreading, we'll say this is just kind of a, a generic mistake rate, you guys, that after proofreading DNA polymerase will still um, introduce one wrong nucleotide in every 10 to the 9th nucleotides. So one wrong nucleotide, this would be a mutation. So that's a pretty low spontaneous mutation rate. So we could argue that if a DNA virus is using cellular DNA polymerase, the DNA viruses likewise would have a pretty low spontaneous mutation rate. But we know there's a big difference when we start talking about RNA viruses. Uh, RNA viruses have RNA genomes, so they have to use RNA polymerase to make copies of the RNA, and we know RNA polymerases don't proofread. So they have a really high spontaneous mutation rate, and again, this is just an approximate, you guys, one wrong nucleotide or one mutation in every 10 to the 5th nucleotides. And this is why RNA viruses have potential for such high mutation rates. And we want to remember, you guys, two examples of RNA viruses that we explored were the influenza virus and the SARS-CoV-2, the um, pandemic, pandemic, <laughs> pandemic coronavirus that's causing so much heartache right now. So 
yeah, influenza viruses and the coronaviruses have potential for high mutation rates because they are RNA viruses. And then um, just in general, folks, like two basic types of, of mutations, um, point mutations or base substitutions, and depending on the, the specific type, they can be silent or missense or nonsense. So a silent mutation is when there's a change in the DNA base sequence, but it, it, um, the, the mRNA codon, right, that's transcribed from that mutated piece of DNA, when it's translated, it still codes for the same amino acid. So there's no difference in the amino acid sequence of the protein. And then missense is when a mutation results in a different amino acid being introduced. And a nonsense mutation is when you have a, a sense, a coding, a, a coding codon, a codon that would be translated into amino acid is um, because of the mutation ends up being a stop codon. So that's a nonsense mutation. And it depends on where these, like a nonsense mutation occurs. If it occurs early in the coding sequence, your mutant protein will just be worthless, right? Just maybe a few amino acids. But possibly if it happens towards the end of the coding sequence, um, maybe, you know, this, uh, this, the, new, the new missense, nonsense, excuse me, codon, maybe you're just missing one or two amino acids at the end of the mutant protein. That, that protein might still be able to um, uh, fold and function normally. Um, I'm just going to pause here really quick. You guys are being invaded by our animals here, so I'm going to throw them out, and then I'm going to continue. Okay, folks, sorry, sorry for that little pause. Okay, and then um, the point or point mutations and then frame shift mutations. You guys remember these are the most devastating type of mutations where um, the mutation in the DNA sequence causes um, the mRNA to be read in a totally different reading frame. So you get a total mix up of amino acids. Mutagens are substances which will increase um, mutation rates above the spontaneous mutation rate. So we talked about like UV radiation. Um, there's chemical mutagens that can increase mutation rates. And then folks, we're going to move on. Oh, wait a minute. Let me just back up here. Sorry. So you guys, one thing that I do want to stress is we usually think of mutations as being harmful, but they aren't always harmful. Um, for example, a mutation um, might result in a mutant protein that folds differently so it acquires a new function and that new function might actually help say an organism live in a specific environment so indeed you guys when we're talking about antibiotic resistance genes of bacteria if they involve efflux pumps or they involve hydrolytic enzymes or mutations that change the shape of the antibiotic target so the antibiotic can't bind to it anymore those would um, those mutations led to all of those antibiotic resistance genes and certainly if the bacterium is living in an environment where a lot of antibiotics are being used so say in a hospital or if it's like a food animal that's being fed a lot of antibiotics in their feeds those mutations definitely help the bacteria survive and then through natural selection those resistant bacteria would be selected for and survive and pass on their genes so mutations aren't always bad and indeed, you guys, especially with the asexually reproducing bacteria, mutations are really important for helping to generate genetic diversity in a population of bacteria. Because for, for natural selection to work, you have to have genetic variants in a population, right? So if you don't have um, genetic variants in a population, um, natural selection can't work, you won't get biological evolution, so the population of organisms over time can't can't become better adapted to their environment. Okay, and then folks, um, again talking about bacteria because they reproduce asexually, generating genetic diversity is really important for them, right? 
And so another way that um, bacteria can increase genetic diversity is through horizontal gene transfer. Right? And you'll recall that if a linear piece of donor DNA gets introduced into recipient bacteria, and remember linear DNA will be destroyed by the bacterial enzymes that think this might be like a phage DNA. So for linear donor DNA to survive within the recipient, you'll recall it has to get inserted into the recipient's um, cr chromosome. And very often this occurs through this amazing process called homologous recombination where donor DNA basically ends up replacing some of the recipient's DNA. Um, now, in contrast, you guys, if we have a donor transfer a plasmid, a circular plasmid, it's not a problem because the recipient bacteria won't destroy circular DNA, right? So plasmids don't have to be integrated into the chromosome. Um, and let's see here, another example would be like a transposon. Right, a transposon, there'll be like hot spots maybe on the chromosome where a transposon can insert itself. Um, so again, um, this is how the transposons can prevent um, from being destroyed, those jumping genes. So um, you'll recall folks, we, we talked about three different types of horizontal gene transfer. Um, transformation, and this was Frederick Griffith's cool experiment using the smooth encapsulated streptococcus pneumonia and the are the rough um, non-encapsulated streptococcus pneumonia and remember he was basically trying to develop a vaccine and just kind of cutting to the punchline here you guys remember that when he took the virulent um, encapsulated S strain and killed them yeah and then he mixed them with the A virulent R strain the lactic capsule he mixed those together and vaccinated the mice with them the mice surprisingly surprisingly ended up dying and when he necropsied them and then cultured the blood and fluids and tissues, he, he recovered what grew on the plates were encapsulated. They appeared to be smooth, the S strain, you know, which was a puzzle because he thought he'd killed them all. So he came up with a brilliant model that the dead S strain had lysed and released transforming factor genetic information. And back then they didn't know that genetic information was DNA and that the R strain had taken up the transforming factor and we now know those would be the genes for um, capsule production and through homologous recombination the living R strain had incorporated the genes for capsule production into their chromosomes and then they could start making capsules and that's what he he actually recovered was the transformed R strain. Now in nature for this to happen um, the recipient has to be what we call competent. They have to be able to make DNA binding proteins that can bind to naked DNA in the environment and then, and then pass it across the cell membrane. And not all bacteria in nature are competent, but in this case it was kind of lucky we could say that Griffith chose Streptococcus pneumonia because they can become competent naturally in nature. They can be naturally transformed. And, and the concern is, you guys, again, this is a way for virulence factors because definitely capsules are virulence factors can be shared amongst population of organisms and it's also how antibiotic resistance genes can be shared. The um, second example of horizontal gene transfer was conjugation. Some people call this bacterial sex which I really strongly disagree with because in so-called sex you have two genetically distinct parents who make gametes and then the gametes combine and give rise to a genetically unique offspring. So bacterial conjugation isn't sex, even though some people say it looks like sex. Um, but you'll recall, you guys, we focused on E. coli. And E. coli, if it carries the fertility factor, which is a DNA sequence that encodes the information for these incredible um, conjugation pili, also known as sex pili or F pili, the um, F positive so-called male or donor um, in in communicating with neighboring bacteria recipients through chemical messengers called pheromones. In, in response to a recipient being in the neighborhood, the, the F positive donor can synthesize this beautiful long hollow um, conjugation pillus and can bind to specific receptors on the surface of the recipient and then disassemble the pillus. And that shortens the pillus, it draws the recipient to close physical contact. And then the, the base of the sex pillus is act, acting really as kind of like a hypodermic syringe and needle. The, the donor can then inject the recipient with the F factor. And, and we saw there was different combinations of um, what could be transferred from the donor to the recipient. 
and we said it could be the F plasmid itself could be transferred. Um, if the um, F plasmid gets inserted into the donor's chromosome, right, the, um, during conjugation, a copy of the donor's chromosome can be transferred to the recipient, right? So that was that HFR times an F negative um, recipient. So you can actually get transfer of a copy of donor bacterial chromosomal genes, which could carry virulence factors or um, say antibiotic resistance genes to the recipient. The last example of horizontal gene transfer was um, through transduction. And this is when bacteriophage would infect a donor. And this would be um, an example of lytic replication. And in lytic replication, you'll remember that the donor's um, chromosome gets cut up to act as building blocks to make copies of phage DNA. And then when the phage proteins are being assembled into the heads, the capsids, and then um, um, automatically the capsids get packaged with little pieces of, of DNA. Um, most of the DNA probably will be phage DNA, but occasionally there might be a little piece of donor chromosomal DNA that gets packaged into a phage. And then when the bacterium lyses and releases that um, transducing phage, right, that phage is still infectious, it can bind to a neighboring recipient and inject the donor DNA into the recipient and then it can get inserted into the uh, recipient's chromosome through homologous recombination. So that's called generalized transduction. The more complicated um, type of transduction, guys, was, was the specialized transduction. And remember, temperate bacteriophage, they can do either the lytic cycle or the lysogenic cycle. In the lysogenic cycle, the phage DNA is inserted into the bacterial, bacterial chromosome, forming what's called a prophage. And then during induction, if there's any kind of DNA damage, that triggers the phage to cut itself out of the bacterial chromosome uh, and, and triggers entry into the lytic cycle. Sometimes when the phage cuts itself out of the, um, the donor's DNA, it can take a little bit of chromosomal DNA with it. So that becomes a template for um, DNA replication in the lytic cycle. So all of the phage then would be recombinant phage. They'd be carrying the phage DNA and a little bit of... Um, of the um, donor uh, chromosomal DNA. So then when they infect a neighboring bacterium, they're injecting the phage DNA and that little bit of chromosomal DNA from the um, donor. So you can get integration of the phage DNA and the donor DNA right into the recipient's chromosome. Sometimes it'll only be the little piece of donor um, bacterial DNA that gets inserted in the chromosome. But that's called specialized transduction because only the special genes on either side of where the phage, the, the prophage was formed in the donor um, bacterium, only the genes on either side of where the prophage is located will be transferred to the recipient. And this one, folks, um, now that we know about specialized transduction, we can answer this question. Uh, how, basically, how did E. coli 0157H7 evolve? And you'll recall that E. coli 0157H7 um, carries the gene for shigatoxin. And shigatoxin is horrible, right? Because <laughs> shigatoxin, it inhibits our eukaryotic ADS ribosomes. It can cause, um, it's fecal oral transmission, right? So if, say, ground meat is contaminated with fecal bacteria, if there's any E. coli 0157H7 in there, and we don't cook the ground meat really well, the E. coli 0157 might still be alive. So we swallow, we swallow the E. coli in it, it colonizes the intestine, it starts pumping out the shiga toxin. Um, it, causes a, it can cause a bloody diarrhea, blood vessel damage, it can cause a hemolytic anemia and kidney damage. And so you can get this potentially fatal hemolytic uremic syndrome. And this is really, really frightening in little children, right? Um, so always be really careful, you guys, when you, um, when you cook ground meat of any kind, make sure you cook it really well, thoroughly because um, you want to kill any fecal pathogens that are inside the meat patty. And also, you guys, we've had transfer of E. coli 157H7 and fecal contaminated fruit and veggies, right? So how did the E. coli acquire the shigatoxin gene? It was through specialized transduction. So the donor was a cousin of E. coli called Shigella dysenteria, which carries the shigatoxin gene. The Shigella at some point had been lysogenized, and then there was induction. So when the prophage cut it, cut itself out of the Shigella dysenteria chromosome, it cut into the chromosome and cut out the shigatoxin gene, 
and then again the then that combination of phage and shigatoxin were the template um, for phage DNA replication so all the phage that were released from the shigella dysenteria they all were recombinant phage they all carried the phage DNA and the shigatoxin gene and so one of those recombinant phage um, bound to a neighboring E. coli and again shigella and E. coli are close cousins injected the DNA and the, the phage with the shigatoxin gene integrated into the E. coli chromosome. So we say that the E. coli has been lysogenized, right? So it's got a prophage in the chromosome and right next to the prophage is the shigatoxin gene. Just really briefly, you guys, we talked about plasmids. Um, plasmids are double-stranded circular DNA. Um, some bacteria have them and some bacteria don't have them. Usually they carry what we call extra genetic information. And we said, you know, extra genetic information might be antibiotic resistance genes. So we call those R plasmids or resistance plasmids. And then a nightmare, you guys, are the conjugative R plasmids. So a conjugative plasmid, you guys think of the fertility plasmid, the F plasmid of E. coli. It's got all the genes to make the conjugation pillus and um, all the genes for doing the DNA transfers. We'll just take basically those F factor genes and put them on an antibiotic resistance plasmid right and then you have a conjugate of R plasmid and this is bad news because now the donors carrying the conjugate of R plasmids now they can make copies of this conjugate of R plasmid and pass pass these through conjugation to all their neighbors so you can see this would be a way for really rapid antibiotic resistance to spread amongst a population of organisms and then transpose on you guys the so-called um, jumping genes described by Barbara McClintock back at Cornell University, the so-called jumping genes, they can jump from a chromosome to a plasmid, they can jump from place to place on a chromosome, place to place on a plasmid. Um, one, one of the big concerns is they you can have antibiotic resistance transposons, and these two, again, you can have conjugative antibiotic resistant uh, transposons, so the, the same kind of problems that we see with a conjugative R plasmid. So this is a way for rapid spread of antibiotic resistance amongst a population of um, bacteria. So again, you guys, I think we'd already covered this. So you remember um, we were saying a big theme in biology is biological evolution, which is a change in the genetic makeup of a population of organisms over time. And the, the, we would say the advantage of biological evolution, it lets a population of organisms become better adapted to their environment over time, right? And we said one of the driving forces of biological evolution is natural selection, in which the environment chooses which genetic variants are best adapted in the, in, to a particular environment. Um, those variants are going to live longer and have more offspring, and then pass those variant genes onto their offspring, who then will have a better chance of surviving in generation after generation. This results in a change in the genetic makeup of the population, so hopefully the population has a better chance of surviving in an ever-changing environment. And we know, you guys, that we can, um, we humans, unfortunately, by overusing antimicrobial drugs inappropriately, or maybe like adding them in low amounts to animal feed to increase weight gain or milk production or egg production, we're altering the environment. So we're actually selecting for the antibiotic resistant bacteria. And that this is one reason why we're having such a problem with multi drug resistant bacterial pathogens today. Um, and again, folks, I you know I love these kind of concept maps. A, a cartoon, you know that that um, one cartoon is worth you know two hours of lecture. So these are just mechanisms by which bacteria can live in the presence of antibiotics. So th these would be like antibiotic resistance mechanisms. So one thing you guys remember that sometimes just the cell wall of the bacterium can inhibit diffusion of the antibiotics. So one example would be most gram-negative bacteria, penicillin can't cross through the outer membrane porins. So most gram-negative bacteria are naturally resistant to penicillin. There's always exceptions. And then another great example, you guys, would be the, the waxy, mycolic, acid-rich cell walls of our acid-fast bacteria, like Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Mycobacterium leprae. It's so hard for antibiotics to diffuse across that waxy cell wall. So the acid-fast bacteria are naturally resistant to a lot of antibiotics. And then, folks, we said that, um, for example, in Staph aureus, when we first we're using penicillin, we overused it, and thus we selected for mutants, Staph aureus mutants, who had the enzyme beta-lactamase so that they could destroy the, the penicillin, amoxicillin, amoxicillin, and ampicillin, right? 
um, and then another um, another mechanism of antibiotic resistance is um, what we saw in MRSA, right? So um, methicillin is supposed to be beta lactamase resistant, so we started using that a lot, and then we selected for Staph aureus mutants um, who had a mutation in the bacterial transpeptidase gene. So the the MRSA, the methicillin resistant Staph aureus um, bacterial transpeptidase. Oh my gosh, you guys, maybe I said that wrong. Let me back up here, okay? So in MRSA, the methicillin resistant Staph aureus, there is a mutation in the gene for the bacterial transpeptidase. So you guys, I think I misspoke there just a little bit earlier. So MRSA have a mutant bacterial transpeptidase to which none of the beta lactams can bind, right? And the problem is usually MRSA are already resistant to multiple antibiotics, right? So some of those MRSA strain, we just, we don't have anything left to treat them with, right? And then these are the really scary ones, you guys, these efflux pumps. So these are protein pumps in the cytoplasmic membrane that just pump out the antibiotic. It, it gets into the cell, they just pump it right out. And remember the concern here is these can be nonspecific. So they can pump out more than one antibiotic or more than one inhibitory um, chemical. So that's kind of bad news. So let's hear you guys. So that was the end of microbial genetics. And then we we're on to viruses. So you guys, I'm going to close this one down because I'm getting all kinds of dings on my phone. So I'll check my email here really quick. And then in a little bit, we'll come back and we'll do, um, hopefully we can do viruses and prions all together. Okay, you guys.